Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. Uh, it is Tuesday, September 15th. Uh, we're certainly pleased to have everybody here tonight. Uh, we are going to start our meeting by introducing you to your City Council. Council members Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Jameson. Here. Karski. Here. Kylie. Here. Rolfing. Here. Staggers. Anderson. Here. Thank you, Lori. In the uh, City of Sioux Falls, we start our City Council meetings with an invocation. Uh, we are very, very blessed to have Pastor Kirk Flaw back uh, to lead us in that invocation tonight. He's with the Abiding Savior Free Lutheran Church here in Sioux Falls. What we'd ask is that you stand for the invocation for the blessing and then remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Pastor Kirk, thank you so much for coming back. Yeah, a real joy to be able to come tonight, a privilege indeed to come and share. Uh, on behalf of our church family, of course, want to again uh, say thank you for all of you and your service and know that um, all of you are prayed over by our church family, and we're grateful for your leadership, uh, each and every one of you. I'm going to share from the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 14. It says, where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. And, of course, the idea there is that there are good leadership, and we need a number of good leaders, and we are blessed, I believe, in this community to be able to have a number of good leaders, and we are grateful uh, to be able to pray for you and to encourage you this night, especially as you discuss budget items. And I know from the church business, that's always an interesting evening as well. And I'm confident it'll be an interesting evening here too, perhaps. So let's pray. Lord, we would ask for your favor and your grace upon this gathering tonight. And I offer a thanksgiving for the privilege of coming and being able to share. And Lord, we want to ask for your presence here tonight. We want to pray for wisdom and guidance and direction in all things. And we, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to pray for these leaders and for your provision of them. God, we would commit now this night into your care, asking for your continued grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Julie, Julie Briggs. It's Ju Julie, welcome. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you, Julie, for being here. Did you want to bring anybody else up? Okay, well, I'm glad you're here. Uh, folks, I do have a couple proclamations I'd like to read on behalf of the 175,000 people who call the city home. The first one reads, Whereas the Congress, by joint resolution, has designated October of each year as National Disability Employment Awareness Month, and whereas the purpose of this month is to celebrate the many and varied contributions of America's workers with disabilities and educate the public about disability employment issues, and whereas approximately 15% of the city's population have disabilities, and each is a family member, friend, neighbor, employee, and customer, and whereas all persons with disabilities have the right and the responsibility to be active, contributing members of our society. And whereas workplaces that welcome the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a crucial part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and a strong economy. Now, therefore, I, Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim October 2015 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month in Sioux Falls and encourage all residents, businesses, organizations, and government agencies to observe this month by bringing down barriers and by supporting initiatives and activities that promote and support employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Julie, thank you for being here tonight. Let's give a round of applause. And do I have a representative uh, with, with NAMI, please? Well, oh, yes, welcome. Come forward, please. Thank you. Would you please introduce uh, yourself as well as uh, the others here tonight? Hi, I'm Phyllis Ahrens. I'm executive director of NAMI Sioux Falls. And I'm Sandy Holloman, one of the members of NAMI. 
I'm Wayne Earns, a volunteer for NAMI South Dakota. Wonderful. Thanks for being here tonight. The proclamation reads, whereas serious mental illnesses, including major depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, affect one in every five people annually. More than 25,000 people in Sioux Falls and one in 17 adults live with a serious mental illness. Whereas approximately 50% of chronic mental illness begins by the age of 14 and 75% by the age of 24. Whereas long delays, sometimes decades, often occur between the time symptoms first appear and when individuals get help. Early identification and treatment can make a difference in successful management of mental illness and recovery. Whereas every citizen and community can make a difference in helping end the silence and the stigma that for too long has surrounded mental illness and discouraged people from getting the help that they need. Whereas NAMI Sioux Falls provides public education and civic activities to help improve the lives of individuals and families affected by mental illness. Now, therefore, I, Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim October 4th through the 10th, 2015, as Mental Illness Awareness Week in our town and encourage citizens, businesses, schools, and community organizations to take the stigma-free pledge and to participate in the candlelight walk on Sunday, October 4th at First Lutheran Church. Thank you uh, for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. My mom was the head nurse at the, well, what we used to call the old state hospital. Now it's called the Human Services Center. So on behalf of her and, and myself and the 175,000 people that, that call the city home, thank you for what you do. Everybody? Council, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to our consent agenda. Uh, any items to discuss on the consent agenda or motions? Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second, Anderson. It's been a motion to approve our consent agenda, <coughs> agenda <coughs> items. It has been seconded. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Uh, now, Council, our regular agenda. Uh, in, any motions? Move to approve, Erpenbach. Second, Karski. Councilor Erpenbach's made a motion to uh, approve our agenda tonight. Say to my Councilor Karski, any discussion? Councilor Karski. Yes, Mayor. Make a motion to amend um, by moving agenda item 31 before agenda item 25. Second, Erickson. There's been a motion by Councilor Karski, seconded by Councilor Erickson, to move agenda item 31 before agenda item 25. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. We'll now vote on the amended motion. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Folks, welcome. What a great crowd. It's great to have you engaged in our community. We appreciate it. This is actually a, an opportunity for you to engage the council on any topic that you want uh, involving, involving our great city. However, we also know that there's a number of people in the audience tonight that want to talk about the budget. Uh, we are going to talk about that. Uh, that's item 31. If you want to talk about the budget, we'd ask you to hold your comments till then. Uh, however, if there's other topics, just come forward to requests. State your name as well as if you could keep your comments to five minutes or less, the council would appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Bruce Danielson, Sioux Falls. I've been researching on SIRE quite a bit this past week trying to finish this personal project. And thanks to Lori Hogstead, I've been able to do some SIRE research for this meeting. 
As a side note, I've tried to use, view old meeting videos, and this is what I've been getting from on several different computers. If you notice, the, uh, it's not surprising me, to me the videos do not run from, from ending to beginning as long as they show upside down and reversed. <laughs> I, it's a little hard to understand what's going on when it looks like this, but anyway. I'm, I'm here tonight to talk about I.L. Wiederman. I met I.L. Wiederman almost three years ago, but had known him since he first took on the City Hall in 2006 and won. Never dreaming I would be in a place where I would need to know him, I just admired him from afar. The City Council and the administration of Sioux Falls have become well acquainted with him through his 29 City Council public input presentations and phone calls. Since the traffic camera company decided to go after his van, <coughs> Today, millions of Americans are benefiting from his principal traffic light case as it is cited to force camera shutoffs all over the nation. When the city decided to put me on its target a few years ago, I decided it was time to meet Dan Daly, Teresa Staley, and Scott Ersman. Through them, I met I.L. These four are some of the best citizens Sioux Falls could ever ask for. I will for be forever grateful for the talks we've had but I.L. remained our man of mystery. I.L. kept to himself. Only in death were we able to find out his full name, military service, family, growing up, plus his wide circle of friends and acquaintances. He had several circles, and none knew the other. He gave all he had to whatever cause he latched on to. He was a very bright man who saw through bluster. He spoke for the person who could not speak. As many of you know, he would call anyone to ask anything and then show up to tell everybody what he had learned. Never eloquent, but always all in. Since last Thursday, I've taken the 29 public inputs and tried to view them. What an education. It appears his adherence to Robert's rules of order made him our gavel club champion with at least three times, including his last visit with me on June 9th. I always principled, caring, thoughtful, generous, and will be missed. He was a big guy with rough edges surrounded a big, soft heart. I always service will be at Miller Funeral Home downtown at 530 on Sunday, September 20th, and all are invited, and we'd like to see you there. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, thank you. Folks, did anybody else want to engage the council? Very good. Robert Colby, Mr. Mayor, Council. I, I read with interest the recent uh, interview that the mayor had done with, uh, that appeared nationally and found it very interesting and then had to hearken back to some of the history. And I think many of the mayors that we had prior to Mayor Heather probably would have said about the same thing in a similar fashion in that the city of Sioux Falls has always been a very progressive entity, not only because of the, the mayor or the council or however the governmental entity was, going back even toward uh, Mike Shermer. Sometimes mistakes were made, and uh, one of those would have been the urban renewal of the early 70s. But that aside, we have still grown, and it's been a combination of business and government working together with the citizens watching over and um, kind of trying to make sure that the course stays between the, uh, the fence lines and some, most often between the uh, curbs on the, on, the, on the roadway. I did find interesting when the mayor said that this was a strong mayor form of government, but I would add a couple extra words. Strong mayor with or by consent because the mayor has the obligations that he or she may do, but the council still can exercise a tremendous amount of input on what happens in city government. Uh, the best illustrations are watching the uh, Republicans in the U.S. House and Senate or watching Democrats in Texas who decided that they were going to absent themselves from a vote in the state house. Now, the council, if it unifies itself, it can, it is under no obligation to 
show up or to vote on anything that comes before them. And they have the, by Robert's rules of order, they can table anything and they can table it ad infinitum if they so choose. But I will give the mayor kudos on working to say something about the need to work with county government. Back in the day when the uh, county commission and the city council used to get together for their monthly coffee and, do and rolls or donuts or whatever, uh, we never could get the mayor to come to one of the meetings. So the county commission said, okay, let's have the chair of the county commission and the mayor get together and you know, compare notes because there are things that the commission, the county commission would like to appraise the mayor of and vice versa. Uh, we didn't always get the best cooperation. There were some mayors that the only way you ever found out what they were doing was by virtue of a news release that they would issue. And sometimes that was exasperating. Other mayors, sometimes it was hard to keep on track because they would sooner talk about the basketball game or the football game, et cetera, but rather than about the business that the uh, city council might have the mayor bring to the county commission chair or the county commission bring from the rest of the county commissioners. The county is constitutional and therefore they get a lot of the flack that they get because things are stacked upon them by the legislature. The city council has the, although it's chartered, it has the opportunity to do things more by choice than by mandate. And that is always one of the problems because the, uh, as the county commission keeps working to try to become more efficient, they get more things to do and they aren't always funded. In fact, many times funds have been taken away from them. When you, earlier, when you talked about the disability community here in Sioux Falls in the days past, we were given the opportunity on the county commission and maybe the city council to participate in a particular disability for a day. And even for a day, if you did such, you learned a lot about that part of the community that has to deal with their trials and tribulations 365 days a year. And I would advise, if possible, that you see if you could take and walk as a blind person for a period of time, or that you might confine yourself to a wheelchair for a day, it does give an enlightening experience. When you talked about the mental health issues, having had relationship with those in my family, it's good to observe it for a week and be appraised of it, but those people who suffer from mental health issues aren't the only people that suffer. The rest of us that are close to those people, we also have to deal with that 365 days a year. Maybe not as intense and on an intense day-by-day -day basis, but at least on a weekly basis. So I would suggest that if you have the opportunity, listen to somebody who has a family member who has that sort of malady because it can be enlightening. Thank you very much. Ms. Kobe, thank you. Folks, anybody else, welcome. I had not checked the agenda before I came tonight, and since some of the, most of what I talk, want to talk about is past agenda issues, but since some run into this year, should I just wait? First of all, can you just give us your name, please? Oh, Roger Algersma. Thank you, Roger. And your question was what, sir? Should I wait till the budget, even though most of my talk is about past budget issues? I mean, it was kind of like how that affects the future teacher. So that would it fit better then? Well, if your conversation involves uh, the budget, whether it be comparing past budgets to, to this budget, I would encourage you to wait till that time. I think it's going to be more relevant. Uh, but if there are topics that are not related to the budget, I'd probably encourage you to do it now. I'll just wait. Thank you, Roger. Appreciate that. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on a topic unrelated to the budget? Thank you very much. We appreciate the input. Item 13. 
Transfer of a 2015-16 retail malt beverage license from the Little Cellar Wine Company, LLC, the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316-18 South Louise Avenue, to the Little Cellar, Inc., the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316-18 South Louise Avenue, CUP not required. Item 14, transfer of a 2015 retail wine license from the Little Cellar Wine Company, LLC, the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316 and 18 South Louise Avenue to the Little Cellar Inc., the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316 and 18 South Louise Avenue, CUP not required. 15, transfer of a 2015 package liquor license from the Little Cellar Wine Company, LLC, the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316 and 18 South Louise Avenue to the Little Cellar Inc., the Little Cellar Wine Company, 2316 18 South Louise Avenue, CUP not required. Item 16, transfer of a 2015-16 retail malt beverage license from LFK Holdings, Inc., Old Schools Wine House and Pub, 921 East 8th Street, to Red Sea Pub, LLC, Red Sea Pub, 921 East 8th Street, CUP not required. 17, transfer of a 2015 retail wine license from LFK Holdings, Inc., Old Schools Wine House and Pub, 921 East 8th Street, to Red Sea Pub, LLC, Red Sea Pub, 921 East 8th Street, CUP not required. 18, special one day malt beverage and special one day wine licenses for Killian Community College to be operated at 300 East 6th Street for a chamber mixer on September 22nd, 2015. 19, special one day wine licenses for downtown Sioux Falls, Inc. to be operated at the following locations. 8th and Railroad Center Lobby, 401 East 8th Street, A League of Your Own, 229 South Phillips Avenue, Atole Salon, 317 South Phillips Avenue, Beat Company, 319 South Phillips Avenue, CH Patisserie, 309 South Phillips Avenue, Chelsea's Boutique, 321 South Phillips Avenue, Exposure Gallery and Studios, 401 North Phillips Avenue, Great Outdoor Store, on East 10th Street, Half Baked, 120 South Phillips Avenue, Lillian's, 311 South Phillips Avenue, NV Salon Studio, 106 West 11th Street. Rayfeld's Art and Framing, 210 South Phillips Avenue. Say Anything Jewelry, 225 South Phillips Avenue. Simply Perfect, 401 East 8th Street, number 108. Sioux Falls Design Center, 108 West 11th Street. Sticks and Steel, 401 East 8th Street, Suite 118. Urban Archaeology, 126 North Phillips Avenue. Young and Richards, 222 South Phillips Avenue. And Zanbro's, 209 South Phillips Avenue for the first Friday Wine Walk on October 2, 2015. Item 20, special one-day package off-sale wine license for downtown Sioux Falls, Inc. to be operated at Exposure Gallery and Studios, 401 North Phillips Avenue for the first Friday Wine Walk on October 2, 2015. 21, special one-day liquor license for Hy-Vee, Inc., all occasions by Hy-Vee to be operated at The Point is to Serve Church, 506 North Kiwanis Avenue for weddings on September 26 and October 3, 2015. 22, special one-day liquor license for Hy-Vee, Inc., all occasions by Hy-Vee to be operated at the Sanford Research Center, 2301 East 60th Street North for the Roosevelt Hall of Fame event on October 3, 2015. And item 23, special one-day malt beverage license for the banquet to be operated at Cliff Avenue Greenhouse and Garden Center, 2101 East 26th Street for a Supply Our Students fundraiser on October 1, 2015, and authorized publication of notice on September 5, 2015. Lori, thank you, uh, David. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, items 13 through 17 involve a change of ownership, uh, which necessitated transfers of those licenses. And items 18 through 23 involve uh, special one-day licenses. David, thank you. Council? Move to approve. Karski. Second, Rolfo. Councilor Karski has been a motion to approve these items. Second by Councilor Karski. A roll call vote, please. Council Members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 24. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving the naming of the Indoor Aquatic Center at Spellaberg Park to Midco Aquatic Center, and authorizing the mayor to enter into a title sponsorship agreement between the City of Sioux Falls and Midcontinent Communications. Don, good evening. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Don Kearney with Parks and Recreation. Um, this uh, ordinance uh, would name our new Indoor Aquatic Center at Spellaberg Park, uh, the Midco Aquatic Center. It uh, approves of the agreement for the exclusive title sponsorship naming rights. Uh, as a reminder, it is a 10-year agreement worth $2.2 million with Mint Continent Communications. 
uh, as uh, in return for that, Midcontinent will be the exclusive provider of landline telephone, broadband internet, cable TV service, along with significant marketing presence both inside and outside of the aquatic center. Uh, and then Midcontinent Communications will also be providing free Wi-Fi service. Uh, with that, I'd uh, be glad to take any questions. Don, thank you very much. Uh, folks, this is a second reading. Did anybody want to speak to this item? Thank you, Councilors. Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Anderson. Councilor Rolfing has made a motion to approve this item, seconded by Councilor Anderson, Jr. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 31. A resolution adopting the budget for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2016, and the 2016 2020 capital program. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. Good evening. Tracy Turbeck with the Finance Office. Uh, before I make my brief remarks about the, uh, the budget, I do want to take just a moment and thank uh, all the folks that are involved in, in bringing us to this point in the budget process tonight. I'll start by thanking the City Council members for their involvement in this process. I know it takes a significant uh, commitment of time on your part to uh, listen to budget presentations, uh, attending uh, working sessions and meetings, uh, I'm on top of, I'm sure, what are uh, many, many emails and phone calls to, uh, to review and, and discuss budget items. Uh, certainly the mayor uh, plays a, a, an integral role in, in developing the budget that's before you tonight, uh, spends many, many hours in meetings with uh, his team. Uh, the department directors and their budget teams uh, just have done a, an excellent job again this year in uh, working with finance and the mayor's office to develop the, the proposed budget. Uh, they certainly de uh, deserve uh, kudos for their, their efforts and professionalism. And last, uh, but by no means least, uh, uh, the team that, that I have the privilege of working with every day is the finance team. And they really, uh, really do excel at their jobs. They're just a, an incredible group of very passionate, very dedicated, very hardworking professionals. And it's uh, my honor and privilege to work with them every day. And they, uh, this, uh, we wouldn't be here tonight uh, with uh, uh, the budget before us if not for those folks. So thank you to all those folks involved. Uh, item number 31 is the budget resolution that does approve the entire city budget for all of our uh, city funds, including governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary funds. The total budget, as presented to you tonight, is $470,614,567, uh, and that covers uh, both appropriated and non-appropriated non funds. The resolution also approves the entire five-year capital improvement program for the years 2016 through 2020 for a total five-year capital plan of $556,643,044. Uh, both items are subject to public hearing tonight, and I think now is the appropriate time to take public input on the resolution and the budget ordinance. Tracy, thank, thank you very much. And and I, too, just want to relay my thanks to uh, uh, the entire team that was involved in this. And I also want to thank the public for being here tonight. This is actually your opportunity to engage the council prior to them beginning their work on the budget, uh, whether it be the operating side or the capital side. Uh, just a couple things to think about. Uh, number one, um, we would ask you uh, not to make your comments repetitive or duplicative. Uh, we, we value, you know, the, the passion. Uh, on, on each of these topics, but if you can find unique ways to either support or go against uh, something that is within the budget, I know the council would, would appreciate that. Um, also, you need to understand you need to do it now uh, if you're going to speak on these particular items because once I turn it over to the council, then it's in their hands and then we can't go back to you for, for more public input. So uh, it's a great opportunity. I am going to start with Roger because of, uh, he wanted to speak earlier. But folks, if you want to speak, uh, just get ready and come on up. Welcome, Roger. And also, two things. You just need to introduce yourself to the people of our town. And number two, we'd ask you to keep your comments to five minutes or less. Roger, welcome. Hello, I'm Roger Algersma. Um, there's a variety of issues in the budget. Um, some of these are past decisions. Some maybe it's still on the table since it's being voted on tonight. 
uh, look at the tip downtown, look at developing railroads and looking at swimming pools and how to charge them um, fees. Uh, 20 years ago, my kids were going to school in Volga, the first little bitty town west of Brookings, and they put in a soybean plant by the railroad, and they've been using that railroad 20 years, and that's a small enough town. They couldn't put millions into subsidizing, you know, industrial parks or anything, and they're still there 20 years later. Something like Capital One, you put a lot of money into, and then they're gone in a few years. I think when industry makes a decision based on what where they fit, is better than making decisions on where they get a little trickle of money. I mean, a few million to some of these people is a trickle of money. Um, we've had railroads coming out of at least three directions out of town, I don't know them all, for a long time, and we've had developers around a long time. And I know this project by the rail yard has been in their process a long time. But when we spend millions of dollars to help an industry get started, when, when, when this city asks businesses to come to put in a store, this, that someone in the city you know, offices says to me, they ask how many rooftops there are. They want to know how many more houses, and if you get this many more houses, they'll come. And so there's something other than just enticing industry with money. Um, with, with I think that <coughs> if if this is gonna have to be done federally, but if, if nobody subsidizes industry and they all go where it, where it pays to be better, it's kind of hard to do that all by yourself. As far as the TIF downtown, it doesn't match the, the blighted neighborhood theory. I mean, with the pavilion across the road, it's not a blighted neighborhood. If you got apartment developers that build apartment buildings and there's the, the poor and the medium and the rich and and this is the most luxurious, and if, if you develop a, a, an apartment and office is not quite as luxurious and you can make your cash flow, and the richest guy says, uh, I can't make it unless I got help from the city, then the guy with almost as luxurious an apartment building is gonna lose customers to the one you subsidize. And, and so it kind of messes up the whole situation. Tips were originally meant for bad parts of town that need to be taken from totally bad to start them up again, not just to fix one lot somewhere. Um, as far as swimming pools, I think it's excellent that cities have swimming pools. And I think with a big city and they got a lot of people that are getting more people in the competitive brackets if you make a, build a bigger swimming pool and indoor, I mean, there, there's some there's some good reason for that. As As far as, how much to charge, I dare bet every pool don't charge as much as it costs to run it. I mean, there isn't any town, I don't think, you know, that's something that you're, it's a service, it's partly a service and partly charged. Some want free swimming for everybody. I it suggests an idea. If you do the math on how many go to the rich new pool, and how much you're subsidizing per person. You subsidize that per person for the poor kids in little pools, you might come up with a, a fair price. Oh, it might yeah. be zero, it might, might, I mean, they're already subsidized already. But uh, just, just some of my thoughts, thank you. Roger, thank you as well, thank you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome. Mr. Mayor and members of the city council, uh, my name is Tom Dempster, and I have the pleasure of being the chair of Friends of Levitt Sioux Falls. Um, with me today are fellow board members. Behind me are Marion Bryan, Sandra, uh, Sandra Pay, and Jennifer Kirby uh, that join me in, well, I guess the things that I'm going to be telling you. Um, we are here to express our gratitude. We're here to express our gratitude for your work, Mr. Mayor and for your work, members of the City Council, uh, and for the work of Don Carney, the Parks Board, and the Parks Department of including Levitt at the Falls in the proposed CIP that you have before you tonight. Um, this will be a public-private partnership with the City of Sioux Falls, 
of the National Levitt Foundation and the Friends of Levitt Sioux Falls. Uh, soon we will have a state-of-the-art venue at Falls Park, uh, the birthplace of Sioux Falls. The, fa the facility will be the northern anchor um, to Phillips to the Falls and will fill downtown with 50 free professional concerts, not only helping to establish this town, well, this city as a creative place, but also using the power of music to bring all of our diverse communities together in downtown Sioux Falls over and over again. Well, people ask, how did Sioux Falls, how well, uh, how did Sioux Falls ever get the Levitt? Well, much of the answer is with us tonight. Strong, thoughtful, elected leaders who have dreams for this community and fulfill those dreams. This is public testimony. Members of the city council and Mr. Mayor, our testimony is to ask you for your support for the CIP budget and our testimony is also to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council on any topic involving the budget? Welcome. Hi, my name is Lisa Brunick. I'm an art teacher at Hawthorne Elementary School. I'm Jennifer Waldera. I'm a Memorial Middle School art teacher. And I'm Beth Babb, and I was um, a co-chair of the Community Youth Mosaic Wall. We are teachers here to remind you that we're talking about children. You may remember that I spoke to you last spring on behalf of hundreds of students, artists, art teachers, parents, school district officials, city government, and business leaders who worked very hard on this project for several years. At the time of each of our installation ceremonies, public leaders from the school district, the business sector, and city government all stood in front of lively crowds of kids and families, graciously thanking the kids for their gift of art and pledging to always take care of it. In fact, I have here a copy of the original city agreement dated August 29th of 2005. That was 10 years ago, which clearly states in Section 2, the artwork shall be the property of the city and the city will maintain the artwork. And in Section 7, the agreement states, this agreement shall inure to the benefit of and be binding upon the heirs, executors, administrators, assignees, and successors of the respective parties. <coughs> Isn't that all of us? Isn't that you? I don't understand how it's even possible that we could consider breaking this agreement. Are we a community who makes good on its promises or not? Are we a community who supports the arts or not? It would be an unimaginable tragedy to lose this treasure to neglect, or worse yet, to an uncaring attitude. I implore you to do the right thing. Please vote to protect the integrity of our children's gigantic symbol of hope, promise, and peace. Vote to ensure the repair and the maintenance of your community youth mosaic. Michelle, we have waited a long time for a city advocate to stand up on our behalf. I feel like you have listened and understood and acted in the best interest of all of us. Thank you so much. Lisa, Jennifer, and Beth, thank you very much. Folks, anybody else? Welcome. Greg Neitzer, Sioux Falls. Um, First, uh, one of my favorite sayings is, first tell the truth, then give your opinion. 
In that spirit, I have to apologize. Last week, I said that the 0.08% of the sales tax was not used for arterials, and Public Works has been kind enough to correct me on that. So um, they did a great job with that. So I, I don't know where I got that, so I apologize for that. Um, first, um, I would urge you to eliminate the facade easement program. It's a giveaway. Um, second, I would urge you to second any amendments that come forward from anybody. Have the courage to uh, have a roll call vote. Don't let things die for lack of a second. Probably one of the most embarrassing things I see every year is all of these amendments dying for lack of a second. If, if you're against it, that's fine, but second it for discussion purposes and let's have a roll call vote. So uh, put your money or your vote where your mouth is. Um, and then as far as um, the tax increase, which I don't know if we're gonna have that as a separate agenda item or if you just want me to take it It's okay, it Greg, keep going. Okay. Um, we have record revenues, we know that. We're proposing the largest budget in city history, which I think is a dubious distinction to say the least. Uh, many citizens are struggling. There's just no reason that we need to raise taxes, especially when I look at what it's going to generate. There's something that could be cut. So that's it. Thank you. Great. Very good. Thank you. Folks, anybody else? Council? If you wouldn't mind, Council, could, would, could we start with a motion to approve and second and then let's go into, the, if you wouldn't mind, Councilor Anderson, Jr., would you mind doing that? Motion to approve. And Thank, second, Rolfing. Thank you. Councilors, I appreciate that. Uh, these are the council chairs. Council Chair Anderson, Jr. has made a motion to approve uh, item 31. Uh, and Council Vice Chair Rolfing seconded that. Council. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Motion to amend the... Lori's going to read yeah. them all of them. Okay. But just a motion to amend the <clears throat> budget for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2016. All right, and would you like me to start with number one? Okay. Amendment number one, staggers sponsored. A motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Anderson, Jr. to amend the 2016-2020 Capital Improvement Program and 2016 budget by deleting $85,000 from 2016 for design and $471,000 from 2017 for construction of a new shelter, walkways, lighting, interpretive signage, irrigation, and landscaping at Van Epps Park, project number 14056, Van Epps Park Development, 2016 to 2020, page 101. Second, Karski. Thank you. There's been a motion to amend, and it has been seconded by Councilor Karski. Councilor Anderson, Jr. On this, um, I've spoken a little with Councilor Staggers on this. Um, basically, he thinks that uh, at this time, this the development of the park is not needed and should be uh, looked at when we uh, look at building a new facility in that area. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Bach? I would just say that this is actually one of, of uh, three original amendments that were very similar, and so I, I support this amendment and uh, would encourage my colleagues to do as well. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jamison? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Thank you. Uh, is there another amendment? Motion to, amend, uh, motion to amend. Thank you. All right. Amendment number two is Staggers sponsored. A motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Anderson, Jr. to amend the 2016-2020 Capital Improvement Program and 2016 budget by removing $250,000 from 2016 project number 06002 Administrative Office Building, page 25. Second. There's been a motion to amend, and it has been seconded. Discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Jameson? No. Karski? No. Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. 
That has failed zero seven. Is there another amendment? Amendment number three, a motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Erpenbach to amend the 2016 general fund expense budget planning department for biannual maintenance of the community mosaic wall at a cost of $10,000 annually, funded from unobligated fund balance. Second, Karski. There's been a motion by Councillor Erpenbach to amend the, the budget, seconded by Councillor Karski. Councillor Erpenbach. Thank you, and I appreciate the second. Um, this isn't one that I've worked on any votes, as I was saying to Councillor Rolfing. This is, this, as we know, this wall was accepted as a gift to the city from a group of very important citizens, our children. And $10,000 a year really covers only very minimal maintenance, but I expect the city of Sioux Falls to stand by its promise. The gift was given, at, and at that time we made the promise that we would maintain that gift. I expect to see this $10,000 line item and more, because it will need more, repeated in future years, but I'd ask my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. Oh, yes, Councillor Erickson. Thank you. Um, I, the only statement that I want to make being newer to the council, um, just being my first year in, I, I don't know if this is, um, I, I support this. I don't know that this is the standard that councils have done in the past. Doesn't mean that we can't do it. But what I'm frustrated with is that we had to do this. It was an agreement. It was a gift. It was something that was supposed to be done. And I think maybe um, there were some lessons learned along the way that when we accept gifts, what does that mean? Is it perpetuity? Is there an end date? What does it look like? Is it a match for fundraising? I don't know. But I certainly think we learned some lessons along the way. I support taking care of this. But we need to do this right next time. This isn't how we do things. Yes, uh, Councillor Jameson. I was just wondering who would be uh, in charge of taking care of this. Who are you putting might, in planning? The amendment, if you note, the amendment puts it into actually the planning department. I'd be open to it moving after after a period of time, but right now I'd like it to be in the planning department. So if I could have somebody from the planning department uh, come up, I guess the point is, uh, as Councillor uh, Erpenbach had stated, she expects this to be done. Uh, and I would actually challenge the administration on how how can she expect it to be done. Uh, Mike Cooper with Planning and Building Services. The city has a contract with uh, uh, an entity to look at maintenance of all of our public art, including Sculpture Walk, other art features that we have throughout the city. So we reach out to them, but we've also anticipate reaching out to other entities that were involved with the original installation of the art mosaic wall to look at the best use of, of the $10,000. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, not a question, but just a statement. I also very strongly support this. I also feel that uh, after we get through this budget and take care of this piece of artwork, uh, that we need to look at long term. And as we become more uh, a city that supports the arts, making sure that the arts, that art works that we take under contract actually are placed in the proper place, whether it be indoors, outdoors, so that we don't have this issue again. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed seven to zero, amendment four. Amendment four, a motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Jamison to amend the 2016 general fund expense budget city council for the city of Sioux Falls citizen survey at a cost of $20,000 funded from unobligated fund balance. Second Anderson. Uh, there's been a motion to amend by Councillor Jamison, second by Councillor Anderson Jr. Councillor Jamison. I've had uh, great discussions with most of the councillors, but as all of everybody is aware, we do these surveys uh, every other year. It gave us great, great data to uh, make decisions just like we're making tonight in the direction and uh, issues that the public sees as important. So I encourage you to uh, support the funding of these continuously, but more importantly, the 20,000 for tonight. Any roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Amendment 5. A motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Jamison to amend the 2016 general fund 
expense budget, city clerk for overlap training of Sioux Falls city clerk position at a cost of $42,000 funded from unobligated fund balance. Second, Karski. So a motion by Councillor Jameson to amend the general fund, seconded by Councillor Karski. Councillor Jameson. Just a little further explanation, and I'm sure others will chime in, but uh, as the uh, clerk had read, there's a, uh, a need for additional funding for some uh, training to occur for the uh, new clerk that would come someday. And uh, so this is an attempt to help that transition occur. And I will... A Rockville, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Venice Vance, 7 to 0. Amendment 6. A motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Erpenbach to amend the 2016 2020 Capital Improvement Program and 2016 budget by adding $85,000 in 2016 and $51,000 in 2017 for the engineering needed to prepare for development of Master Plan Phase 3, should read, at the Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum, Project Number 14034, Arboretum and East Sioux Falls Park Development 2016 17. Second, Anderson. Councilor Box made a motion to amend uh, the capital improvement program and seconded by Councilor Anderson Jr. Councilor Bach. Thank you. Well, my colleagues have heard me speak at length about the way the city honors gifts or maybe dishonors them in some cases. The gifts that it, that it accepts from citizens and the Arboretum is one of those landmark gifts really that is literally changing the face of our community. This amendment only restores the engineering and design funds that were taken out of the line item for the Arboretum. I encourage you to adopt this amendment so we can help this important project continue to build momentum toward financial stability. The wedding lawn and other amenities in phase three are the beginning of collecting the operating funds for the Arboretum. We can't compare this project to, the, to Great Bear or to the zoo, which collects significant fees and I don't expect the city to pay for operating funds for this project for the Arboretum, but let's at least honor this gift by allowing it to be ready to operate at the level that it should. I um, urge your support. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed seven to zero. Amendment seven. A motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Erickson to amend the 2016 General Fund Operating Budget Police Department by adding $50,000 for a distracted driving campaign funded from unobligated fund balance. Second, Kylie. There's been an amendment by Councillor Erickson to amend the General Fund, seconded by Councillor Kylie. Councillor Erickson. Thank you. Um, this has, has been um, in the works for some time. I know that it's been uh, an item that we've talked about amongst ourselves as well. Um, during my time in the um, House of Representatives in our uh, state legislature, um, I had the opportunity to vote and be a part of the statewide texting ban, as well as a major component in that particular bill that passed was an educational component. I feel that um, we can strengthen our distracted driving campaign in our city, um, whether it's cell phone use, texting, animals, whatever it might be in your vehicle um, that we're making those um, good decisions. I have reached out to the state uh, and talked to the Secretary of Public Safety, Trevor Jones, and got some additional research as well as uh, Councillor Kiley will be sharing some information as well um, as he's talked to Lee Axtell, the Director of Office of Highway Safety. I've also spoke to um, soon to be new Police Chief Matt Burns. Um, we do have um, an example of what the state does. Maybe we don't have an example. I'm seeing if it's being pulled up. Um, but in that time, um, the state has, uh, has stated that they would love to partner with us and allow us to use that, their campaign and add a tagline to the bottom that it is Sioux Falls and department that we can use it here uh, in the city. I'll let Councillor Kylie go into more detail about those. Councillor Kylie. Well, thank you. And uh, my work with, for the past 30 plus years with the Department of Public Safety, uh, specifically the Office of Highway Safety, um, has enabled me to um, garner their support for this project 
uh, working with Lee Axtall, who is the director of the Office of Highway Safety, as well as uh, Secretary Trevor Jones. Um, they have developed one TV ad and three radio spots that uh, we can use free of charge, no development. The TV uh, spot actually had a cost of $25,000 to $30,000 to produce. Uh, the radio spots, uh, 1000 to 3000 to produce. Again, we would have zero investment uh, in, in production because it's already there. We can add the tagline along with the Office of Highway Safety. Um, and this $50,000, uh, an estimate, it could buy us up to 1,000 to 2,000 radio spots and 200 to 300 TV spots, depending upon uh, cable versus network uh, broadcast. Uh, and there's also the possibility of further grant money being available based on our ability to demonstrate uh, need, and we'd have to work through the Sioux Falls Police Department using uh, a history of citations, et cetera, to establish that need, but there would be the possibility of additional funding in addition to our own $50,000. Um, and so as a result of the city-state cooperation, we, we are able to produce a wonderful uh, and to present a wonderful ad campaign at, at, at up to 50% discount of what it normally would, would cost. And, uh, and a single traffic accident re resulting from distracted driving is likely to cost far in excess of, of our $50,000 investment. In fact, you cannot place a, a price on a human life. So I, I, I think I, I urge your support for this amendment. And I guess if, uh, Jim, if you think you have it up, this is a sample of the TV ad. It's a 30 second. This new phone is awesome. It has made my life so much easier. You know, I get kind of bored when I'm driving and I need to know what's going on. So now, with this huge screen, a keyboard, and a ton of apps, I can get a text and write back right away, no problem. It's like I barely even have to look at it. <laughs> so as you can see, very professionally produced, and in fact, it was produced by a firm right here in Sioux Falls, and so I would urge your support. Hey, roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Amendment 8. A motion to amend the main motion, and, and I'm sorry, I meant to say this is um, Staggers sponsored. A motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 general fund revenue budget by reducing the increase of property tax by $795,239, 1.5% CPI adjustment pursuant to SDCL 10-1335 for 2016. Second. It's been a motion uh, by Councilor Anderson Jr. to amend the uh, general fund revenue budget. Seconded by Councilor uh, Jamison. Councilor Jamison or Councilor Anderson, Jr.? I, I can start on this. Uh, this is something that Councilor Staggers has uh, pursued in the past, and his statement has always been our city is so healthy uh, financially in that, mm -hmm. that we could afford to be able to give our citizens a tax break for uh, at least one year. And uh, past councils were also uh, informed that we would not be able to uh, recoup these revenues, and I believe that uh, Councilman Jamison might be able to give us a little bit more information on that. Is that? I can go roll call vote too, please. Well, I'll take it just, do, just a step further, if I could. The, uh, as you all know, if Councilor Steggers were here tonight, you would hear his argument <laughs> that we've heard for years. Uh, some of the second comes out of courtesy to him. The other part is. Uh, if I could get Tracy to answer a question regarding the loss of this funding, the comment's always been made that if we don't take it, we'll lose it. We had a constituent come tonight and tell us that we shouldn't take this because we don't need to. And I guess it's only fair that we discuss uh, from you, Tracy, what are, the, what are the merits for taking this? Well, I'll let you determine what the merits are if you've got a... a question about what the consequences might be or that's what right the, that's what I okay. mean sorry the uh, as the men amendment indicates it would reduce revenues to the general fund that are uh, for 2016 of, of almost eight hundred thousand dollars and uh, of course the the budget the, the 
spending that's planned for within the budget is dependent upon that, that revenue source, among others, to support that spending. If, if we don't have that revenue source, I think it would be, uh, the prudent approach would be to find cost saving somewhere in the budget. So if you're gonna reduce revenues by $800,000, I think it behooves you to find $800,000 of savings to, uh, to offset that. Because once, once we uh, forego that increase, it becomes more and more difficult to make that up. Now state law does allow us to come back next year and recapture that. But if we don't, if we don't have the will to increase at one and a half percent this year, will we have the will to increase it three percent or four and a half percent next year? That becomes the challenge. We we begin to to some degree dig ourselves a little bit of a hole, and each year we forego that, the hole becomes deeper. So that's that's what I see as the the consequence. The dollars, if you don't find savings, would come out of our reserves, would uh, would uh, erode our reserves by eight hundred thousand dollars. And uh, that's certainly not a, a path I would advocate us taking. Councilor Buck. So along that same line then, most of the amendments, if you're looking at them and the public has them in hand, um, have some sort of replacement. If you're, cutting, or if you're cutting a source of revenue, then you're going to cut an expense, right? And I'm not seeing that in this amendment, so that would be my question to whoever would like to answer that. And then I was looking at some of the other Staggers amendments, and they do have money that is coming from different places, but they're, this is an operating bucket, right? An operating bucket of money, and those are all capital buckets of money, and so that was my first lesson in government financing is that you, they don't cross, right? So that's my concern, is exactly what Mr. Turbeck said, is that's $800,000 we need to find before we vote on this, so I'm not comfortable. Councilor Karski, thank you. Hi, good, Tracy, <clears throat> excuse me. If I recall correctly, on an average $100,000 home, this increase probably means about, what, 10 bucks a year in property taxes, 80 cents a month on property taxes? Is that yeah, I think the, the estimate we put together this year uh, was for a, what I believe is, is reported as a home of a median uh, sales price of $175,000. Recent data indicates that's the median selling price. And the, uh, this 1.5% increase in the city's property tax levy would result in about uh, $10. Mm -hmm. $10? Okay. Thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? No. Jameson? No. Karski? No. Kiley? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. That has failed 1 to 6. Uh, Amendment 9. This is a Staggers sponsored amendment. A motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 2020 Capital Improvement Program and 2016 budget by deleting $300,000 from 2016 project number 17001 Core Facade Revitalization Program, page 145. Mayor, if I can speak to that. We need a second. That is failed for lack of a second. Amendment 10. Also staggers sponsored, a motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 Entertainment Tax Fund capital budget by deleting $250,000 for the Washington Pavilion Garden, project number 13010, Sculpture Garden Improvements from 2015, page 94. Second. Councilor Anderson Jr. has made a motion to uh, ch uh, amend the Entertainment Tax Fund has been seconded by Councilor Rolfing. Councilor Anderson Jr. Um, this one I don't really have a lot uh, from Councilor Staggers. Uh, he just believes that uh, this is too much for the project and would like to see it uh, redesigned. Councilor Mbach. Question, if I might, uh, the amendment as, written, as read by the clerk and as written in our hands says 2015. This is a line item in the 2015 budget that he wants to delete, or is that a typo? I've got 2016. I think it's a typo at the end, yeah, 2015. Yeah. That's a typo. It should be Okay, so acknowledging that that is a typo then, if I might make one comment then, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Councilor Buck. Uh, this is, comes out of the Entertainment Tax Fund, which is, again, that tax fund that is adding to our quality of life. It's one of those things that, you know, if you don't...
spend that tax fund then don't go out to eat and you know don't go to a movie and don't go to the shows at the premier center because that's where this tax fund comes from and then it's adding to our entertainment it's adding to our quality of life i i just can't vote against a, a garden that then is leveraging a whole bunch of money in a big donation as you all well know a hey, roll call please council members erickson no erpenbach no jameson no karski no Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. That is failed. Zero, 07. Amendment 11. Stagger sponsored a motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 general fund expense budget by removing $500,000 from the library expense budget for Kaylee Branch repairs and maintenance. Second, Karski. So a motion by Councillor Anderson Jr. to amend the general fund, seconded by Councillor Karski. Councillor Anderson Jr. Uh, as the uh, council had a discussion earlier today about uh, this item, uh, Councillor Staggers believes that we should wait and come up with some type of future plan on what we're going to do with our libraries and that this one may be repositioned in a new location. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Jameson? No. Karski? Yes. Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. That has failed one to six. Amendment 12. <clears throat> Stagger sponsored a motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 general fund budget expense by adding $500,000 to the parks and recreation expense budget for maintaining trees in the city right of way. Funding to come from unobligated fund balance. That has failed for lack of a second. Amendment 13. A motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Anderson Jr. to amend the 2016 General Fund Operating Budget Attorney's Office by adding $50,000 for the Multicultural Center salaries funded from unobligated balance. Second. It's been a motion by Councillor Anderson Jr. to amend the General Fund, seconded by Councillor Erickson. Councillor Anderson Jr. Uh, this is a late amendment coming to the council. Uh, last week, the mayor and I, as our duties on intergovernmental uh, board overseeing the multicultural center, uh, working in conjunction with the county, had a meeting with uh, their director. And through that meeting, we found that uh, their staff has not had a raise in quite a while. And taking a look at what some of the salaries are there and their responsibilities, um, I felt they were very, very underpaid. And this will just give them a slight bump up, but it will allow uh, the staff to continue there, hopefully, and uh, do, the, do the good work that they're doing at this time. Yes, Councilor Erickson. Question for um, Councilor Anderson, Jr. What is the percentage of increase per employee? What, what are you looking at? I mean, $50,000. Uh, is the amount in here, but what are we looking at for, I mean, is it a straight 3% across the board for each person? Is it, what does it look like? Oh, Sorry to put you on the spot. I just, I know it's Second. a late amendment, so. Do you have that, Mayor? I'm looking. Sorry. Well, I'm going to say that she had some directors that were being paid about $10 an hour. They would be bumped up to about 13. Uh, the highest salary that was going to be, uh, increased was from like 14 to 16. So there, it's, it's no big uh, increases or anything like that. It's just trying to be able to give sal uh, salary increases to staff that they just haven't had the funding to be able to do. Mm -hmm. And the city is the uh, major contributor for the operations there. Thank you. And uh, just so the uh, media knows, I was looking through my emails uh, per Councilor Anderson Jr.'s request uh, to try to find that email. Uh, yes. Here we go. I found I did find it. Thank back. you, Councilor. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let's see. For example, the tutors who make $9 an hour would go to $10.50 an hour. Um, Why don't they do it? They move their teachers from 14 to $17 an hour. These are, these are just things that, once again, this came out of a very late meeting last week, and I asked the director to give us information on uh, what, what this raise would do. 
Uh, it also would take their development director from 1442 an hour to 1683. So they're, they're not large increases, but they're increases that are probably necessary so that, that uh, she has an ability to continue to keep her staff. Uh, Councilor Rittenbach. Question then, remind us how this organization operates and how, how they're funded. Um, I'm, uh, is Tracy? Christy here? I mean, do we, can we talk to the, I mean, I realize it's not a huge amount of money, but this is a little out of left field for me. I'm sorry. I don't, I mean, it's a joint organization, right? Very fair. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with their other sources of funding, uh, but the city does provide uh, some operational funds. Uh, it is budgeted for within the city attorney's uh, departmental budget. We provide, uh, I believe, some uh, funds for to pay their help pay their utility bills and support their operations. Uh, a driving safe driving program, I think, is part of their uh, programs that the city helps fund. Tom, do you have any additional comments for Councilor Buck? Very good, David. Very good, Councilor Buck. Very fair questions, Councilor Jameson. If I could add just for a discussion that uh, um, as those funds are coming from the unobligated fund balance, I mean, this topic could be covered very easily in the future with somebody to come forward and give us a, a healthy presentation that maybe you've received. I think you'll find full support from the council to help that facility. I just don't think that this is the right place to do it. Without that due diligence from us, we're taking your word for it. We believe you. We trust you. We do. But this just isn't the right place to do it. Uh, and so... Uh, I would urge them to come back and give the presentation. You could easily supplement the budget on your request, and you find great support for it. Just and if I may, answer, yes, Councilor Anderson. Uh, and that is one of the things that we did uh, make very clear uh, last week in our meetings that there has been a lack of communication uh, between the county and the city and the multicultural center. We're supposed to have uh, two meetings a year to discuss their operations and, and how they're doing. And uh, I want to thank the mayor for staying on top of it because we were well over that uh, six month time limit to be taking a look at this. So it was just something that I thought could be brought up. And if we need to discuss this further, I'm very open <coughs> to that too. Councilor Buck, final comments? If, if I could just, I would add to what Councilor Jamison said. I, and I, I would be willing to amend the 2015 budget, but not just on the, off the fly like this. I'd, I'd appreciate it. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Erpenbach? No. Jamison? No. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? No. Anderson? Yes. That has failed three to four. Council, any additional amendments? We, uh, yes, uh, Councillor uh, Erickson. Go ahead, Karski. Uh, Councillor Karski. Thank you. Do you have this one, Laurie? I do. Okay, please. Amendment number 14. A motion to amend the main motion by Councillor Karski to amend the 2016 general fund expense budget by removing $500,000 from community development budget workforce development and adding $500,000 to the City Council expense budget for workforce development. Second, Erickson. There's been a motion by Councilor Karski, seconded by Councilor Erickson. Councilor uh, Karski. Thank you, Mayor. Last year, under Councilor Erpenbach, brought this to the Council to put $500,000 in our budget for workforce development. We did put it under community development, and they did a great job. Thank you, Darren, Brent, your staff. Um, but I think, truly, the ownership of this plan belongs under the city council budget. Um, and for us to work with community development or any other organization that may come to us um, as it affects workforce development to be a bigger part of this project or process. So just ask for your support. We're not ending the project. We are just simply moving the accountability for the money back to the city council. Councilor Imbach. Question then, do we have staff to run this project? It's a half a million dollar project. No, I would anticipate that the council would work with community development on, on this project. I realize I'm biased on this project, but I also would remind council that we really are a policy making and appropriating body. We don't do administration and that would be administration for me. I am not comfortable with this. I would urge a no vote. 
they did a great job last year and I think they worked very well with council and I think that should continue. A Yes, Councilor Erickson. I'll just add to it as well since I seconded it, um, second the amendment. Um, part of the idea of me second, seconding this amendment um, was this originally was a pilot program as well. Um, this pilot program was um, um, Councilor Erpenbach with the support of this council, I believe uh, a seven to one vote. And it was that, in fact, a, a pilot program, and we haven't reported back on it yet. It certainly still will be a partnership, but like we talked about on a much smaller scale, I don't mean to compare two separate things, something as, as small as the bus passes. We did not do that and renew that again because it is a pilot program, and we're honoring that to go through until we have the evidence, until people have come back to us and reported to us and said, this is what I did with these public funds I received. This is what I was able to make an impact in our community. This is how I was able to turn that fill in the blank dollars and turn it into this for our community. And so really what it does for me in my mind is hold it back until we get the evidence, move forward and be able to continue that partnership. It's, it's, it's nothing um, disrespectful, it's nothing controversial. Some may disagree with that, um, but it's really just a holding pattern until we finish up the pilot program that this council deemed very important last year to all of us, and we partnered together. It was, it was a, you know, that process had worked together, so I'd, I'd ask you to support this amendment. City Attorney David Fife, any comments? Well, I, I would echo, uh, Mayor, what Councilor Erpenbach said in terms of what the City Council is designed to do under the Charter. Uh, this Workforce Development Program was certainly uh, your brainchild and your policy setting. However, under the Charter, the administration takes over in implementing that policy. As a logistical matter, I think Councilor Erpenbach was correct that uh, you don't have the staff to support this. However, from a practical standpoint, uh, David Bixler, your budget analyst, sat in on the interviews this past year regarding your award of the $500,000 for workforce development, and you were certainly kept apprised. I don't think there's any, uh, my comments are not meant to in any way diminish the council's policymaking role. It's, it's to echo that, that that is your role. Certainly community development uh, could continue working in conjunction with council staff and also still implement the policy that you want. However, that way we wouldn't go against charter regarding the, the roles defined in that instrument. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, I'm also going to agree with Councilor Erfenbach. I believe that, uh, number one, this uh, no money that was spent last year through this pilot project was done without the approval of the council. So I basically anything that community development does has to be approved through us. So we still do have a final say in how that money is spent. And I just, I agree that I don't feel that we have enough staff to actually uh, handle that type of a project. Councilor Erickson. I have a follow-up question for Attorney Fifley. Um, is it within our, our means, the council's mean to, means to have it in a holding pattern and then at that time, reappropriate the money to community development after evidence base of this pilot program completing, getting the report, having them come to us, it, simply sitting here and waiting until we find out how successful this 500, I mean, this isn't chump change. $500,000 is a lot of money. So let's hear the success stories. Let's hear if it was good enough that it's still a priority. Tracy or Tom, could you explain to Councilor Erickson uh, how the funds are, uh, if they are approved or not approved, as well as if they are approved, how they can be controlled by uh, the legislative branch as well as the executive branch. If, if the uh, budget is adopted as it's been presented without amendment, uh, that $500,000 would be budgeted within community development, just as in this past year when, the, uh, when proposals were brought forward uh, to make use of those funds, actually expand them and obligate them uh, that came to the council. So that, that really is the council's uh, role in, in, in executing that part of the, uh, or that, uh, executing that program. So if you, if you want to put it in a holding pattern, so to speak, to use your words, 
Um, you can certainly send that message that the council is, has no intention of approving any additional contracts until you see the results from the, the current program from 2015. So you certainly, uh, as a body, you have the control over whether or not any of the new money in 2016 would actually get obligated and spent. So we legally cannot hold it under the council's budget. Well, he's your legal advisor. And that's why uh, I asked him to begin with. <laughs> I don't know what you Mr. mean Mayor. by holding it within but the budget. I, I'm just saying not act upon it. We, can, we, can we transfer those funds from the council's budget for anything? I mean, if, we, if we've got an extra X amount of dollars, can we transfer it? And I, don't, I don't mean to sound um, naive. I'm just asking legally, can we transfer funds out of a city council budget? Mayor, may I? Yes, With please. With all due respect, Councilor Erickson, I believe that would violate the charter because you are then, as a city council, taking over an executive role in terms of implementing those dollars. And again, as, as Tracy Turback already echoed, I mean, you're, you need to approve before any of those funds are spent. However, it needs to go in an executive branch in order to execute, be able to execute that. And it, it just, it, I think it violates charter if you're, suddenly taking on a more executive role. A real Mayor, yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Can I have Darren Smith come up, please? Darren. I've got a question. Yo, you might. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Thank you. Darren, could you explain this first 500,000, you know, the process that we went through and the controls that are in place? Yeah, well, there are a number, and as you know, I think we've spoken a couple different times about updating the council and involving council staff and, and even inviting uh, Councilor Erpenbach, I think, uh, to some of those, uh, to participate in some of those meetings as well. But uh, yeah, there is a process in place, and I guess I would cut to the chase and say this if it helps. Um, we're not going to move forward with that program without uh, coming back here and letting the council know what the results have been so far of this year's pilot program, and then letting you know what we would recommend uh, going forward. Uh, we wouldn't do that without getting a head nod from this body and understanding their support going forward because it would, it would just be a huge waste of, of our staff time and yours, uh, knowing at the end of the day we're not gonna get support for any of those contracts. So uh, if that helps, uh, you certainly have me stating that. Councilor Jamison. Thank you, and I think the, uh, some of the discussion is getting missed here because nobody wants to hurt anybody's feelings, but I think there's uh, a possible solution here. If we uh, didn't approve the 500 and other uh, suggestions came along to us as things we should fund, we could easily do it that way. And I think that would maybe take uh, some of this issue at hand and put it to rest, and we just address those new opportunities when they're presented to us and we can capture them as we and fund them as we see fit. So I think maybe the best answer tonight for all of us is to just kill this and readdress it when those opportunities present themselves. Yeah. A roll call vote, please. Yes. Wait. Did you, Councilor Rolfing? Did you have a comment, sir? Well, I'm just I'm just thinking then uh, with what Doctor Doctor Darren. Um, <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Nice Smith. Job, wow. He'd be a PhD, not an MD, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Piled high in the, I mean, um, anyway, uh, I'm wondering then if we shouldn't amend this amendment to remove that completely from the, um, uh, from the budget, as Councilor Jameson said, and not direct it toward um, the council, but just have it in reserve so that when you come with your new projects or whatever, we will have that money sitting aside <clears throat> and we'll be able to um, uh, fund it at that time. Is that what your concept was? Well, I don't think we can, if I could. Uh, if I, uh, Councilor Carly, have you had an opportunity to speak on this item? I have not, and I'd love to have, I'd like to ask the doctor yeah. a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. I just wanted to do it for that purpose. No, Thank uh, you. no actually, uh, Darren, what is the end date for the proposals that we accepted, and what was the date uh, that we requested proposals this past year? Well, we launched the program early in the calendar year, and we received proposals, if I remember right, beginning in March and April. We evaluated those, did interviews and so forth, and then awarded those dollars, and as you know, 
some of those contracts and agreements didn't come to this body for your approval until until this summer actually so many of them are really in the early stages they will be anywhere from a several month process to even a full year process so it could be next summer before we'll get results from some of those um, I would just back up a moment and say that if we have to come back and seek approval for dollars once we get into the budget year in all honesty I would tell you that would jeopardize the timing of being able to act quickly enough uh, to put the program in place and see results happen uh, again looking at this current year we went into the budget year in the calendar year 2015 knowing we had those dollars in place so we could um, invest time and incur expenses if that were necessary and so forth to get the prog project uh, and the program up and going so we wouldn't be able to do that beginning right away in the beginning of the year without uh, having those dollars in the budget we'd first have to have you approve that have those be appropriated become effective some 20 to 30 days later before we could even begin um, so I would caution you on that. Um, Councillor Jamison. Uh, I'll yield the floor to Councillor Karski. Councillor Karski. Thank you. Um, maybe a legal question, but what we're looking at doing here is appropriating half a million dollars to the city council budget. We are not, and the, the whole purpose of putting it back into our budget is so that when it is time for the money to be spent either by the community development or somebody doesn't want to go through community development but come to the council with a workforce development plan that we have the ability to make that decision it's simply putting the money in the council budget for those projects as they come up we're appropriating the money we are not and we are wait we are it is sitting in our piggy bank and it is our money to spend not as is all the money, I guess, within the budget that we have. It, it's up to us to approve anywhere that it's spent, but this truly just makes it a city council-owned project. Can I go one more time? Yeah, is it are, a non-repetitive comment, uh, Councilor Rolfing? Uh, <laughs> yes and no, it's an addition to a, a, to a comment because the comment that Mr. Karski made does not take into effect of what our attorney has told us that we may be uh, violating our charter. What we were, what I was saying before is, if we pull this item completely, don't put it in the budget at all. We've got a half million dollars sitting out in limbo. Am I correct? No. That can no. 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 Zero money. Spend the half million dollars regardless. No. 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 We're going to have the balance at the end of the day says we're going to have four hundred. Let's call it five hundred million dollars, and we're going to have four hundred and fifty million uh, 55 million or whatever uh, that we're going to exp uh, expend so we, there'd be a five hundred thousand dollar balance if you will that would that would allow you to come to us and say here's what the plans are and then we could then we could say let's take that five hundred thousand we can we can allocate it so that's that's what I'm hearing Councillor Jamison say will work very nicely Unless Tracy says this is magic accounting again, and I, I we can't do that. Oh. Council, I apologize. I, I, I uh, I'm listening intently, and to, um, uh, Tracy, I'm going to ask you a favor. Could you please come up and explain to the council, the legislative body, not you know who owns what, but just how funds are spent uh, if they are approved by this body for. The, uh, for the purposes of capital or the purposes of the general fund, number one. And number two, if they're not approved, uh, that we can't spend any money. Please explain that. I'll, I'll give it a shot. The, uh, and if I might first address your question, I think uh, Dr. Smith here already addressed the, the, the operational challenges that that would present. If there aren't dollars already appropriated for the program to come back, and go through the appropriation process would, on, would only add time to the point uh, of actually putting the money on the street, so to speak, to where it's, uh, you're going to be halfway through the year before you really get going again. So I, I think that would really delay uh, any, any work that we might actually want to accomplish. Uh, to the, to the, your point, Mayor, I, I'm not sure how, how exactly to articulate that. I, I do see what, what's what I'm interpreting here is that the, the council 
with all due respect, seems to be this amendment would take over an administrative role by, by the legislative body. And I think that's just, that's, that's just not appropriate. I think Councilor, uh, Councilor Fifely, or <laughs> C-O-N-S-E-L, uh, has, has made it pretty clear, I think, that that's, that's an administrative role. The, the council's role is to appropriate the dollars. The administration's role is to execute the budget and carry out those programs. And, and I think you're really, by this amendment, blurring the lines to a significant degree to put program funds into the city council's budget to, uh, to actually execute and carry out a program is, as uh, Mr. Fifely has indicated, is, is not what the charter contemplates. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? No. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. That has failed three to four. Thanks. Council, any additional amendments? We now, yes. Uh, All yes, right. we do. Amendment number 15, a motion to amend the main motion by Councilor Erickson to amend the 2016-2020 capital improvement program and 2016 budget by moving $250,000 um, from 2016 project number 06002 Administrative Office Building to 2018, page 25. Second. It's been a motion by Councillor Erickson to amend the budget, seconded by Councillor Jamison. Councillor Erickson. Thank you. Uh, the intent behind this amendment is to just kick it back a couple of years. Um, in our legislative body, we have talked about our priorities with the county and how important that relationship is with the county. Um, I feel like um, the train has left the station and that this was really in the works and pretty well decided upon before the county truly can come on, on board. Um, so the intent is not to be done with this building. I know a lot of work has gone into it. The intent is to delay it as um, the county is talking about their jail and moving offices and what, what's gonna take place with that. Um, and so I have talked to a couple um, commissioners I think as a city, we can make it work. We can make it work for a little while longer. There is a county summer study as well. Um, my hope is that there, there is some legislative action that actually takes place out of these summer studies and that we can partner together. Um, we've heard a lot about partnering together with the county and so I would ask that the councilors um, support delaying this project two years uh, and vote yes. Councilor Jameson. Thank you, I'd like to add a couple items that maybe haven't been covered. Uh, I live in Lincoln County, and the discussion about this building included uh, working with the county, and I believe there's two counties that we reside in, and Lincoln County has not been brought to the table, and there are great things happening in Canton, but when we have to drive to Canton to take care of some of our own business, and what I hear from people is they're saying, how wonderful would it be to go to a building in Sioux Falls, because that's where I live, and get my plates wherever I'm getting new plates if I live in Lincoln County or Minnehaha County, they go to the same one building. I just sense that we're missing opportunities to collaborate like we're doing so well with other items with the counties. By doing it the way we're doing it, we're also setting the stage that we're going to do it no matter what, and we're going to do it here. If you like it, great. If you don't, we're moving on. But there just isn't the collaboration together that I think we're, uh, we're looking for. So I urge you to move it <clears> to <throat> Councilor Kelly. I love the counties, I love the county commissioners. However, I'm charged with doing the business of the city. I do not have control over county business or county decisions. I elect to deal with the issues that are within my control. Um, saying that, I would still love to involve the county in all ways possible with a space needs building. Uh, there's other, other ways that I think we can still explore. Uh, and we, we, we saw a presentation earlier this afternoon that we have implemented a number of short term fixes and despite our best efforts, we're still bursting at the seams. Further delay on this is just going to cost us more money it's going to put, create more stress for our employees, and I'm very pro-employee because uh, happy employees uh, uh, perform good work 
and deliver good services to our citizens. So uh, I urge you to vote no on this. Councilor Anderson, Jr. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I also respect the work that the counties do and understand that they have their priorities. Uh, but I look back in the past also, a few years ago, the council put away $100,000 uh, or more money than that for uh, archive facility. A million three. A million three. We are still waiting uh, for that facility to uh, move forward. Uh, and that's money that could have been used for other things. We continue to uh, bank that money away. The county is working on other priorities like the jail and I, I feel that they're going to have even more priorities after that. Lincoln County has had, a, has had many opportunities mm -hmm. to be able to move a satellite office into Sioux Falls to uh, help facilitate uh, those type of things that Councilman Jamison discussed. Uh, I feel that, like Councilor Kiley says, uh, we're here to do the city's business, and we got a great presentation uh, this earlier this evening on the facility, how it will be built larger than what we need uh, to help facilitate uh, moving in any other entities, and the building can also be amended. So I would uh, hope that we can just move forward with this. Thank you. Councilor Buck. Thank you. I would just add to that that this is a long-term building. This is not a 10-year building. This is a 50 to 100-year building, and our collaboration with the counties is also a long-term plan. This is not something we're going to do overnight. I would encourage you again to work for what the city needs and to be thinking for the future that yes, absolutely we're working with these counties because they're our friends, our neighbors, they're us. Vote no on this amendment. A roll call vote please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? No. Jamison? Yes. Karski? No. Kylie? No. Rolfing? No. Anderson? No. That has failed two to five. Any additional amendments, Council? Any additional amendments, Council? We now have an amended main motion in regards to the operating budget uh, as well as the capital budget for the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, if there is no further discussion, a roll call vote, please, on the amended main motion. Council Members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed seven to zero. Thank you, Council. Item number third, no, no, I'm sorry, number 25. 25, yes. Second reading in ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing appropriations authorizing an increase in property tax revenue pursuant to SDCL 10 and the means of financing them for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2016. <coughs> Second. Mayor. You need that second. We need a motion. 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 motion to amend to reflect changes to the resolution adopting the budget and the capital program. Second, Rolfing. There has been a motion to amend to reflect the changes of the resolution adopting the budget and the capital program, and it has been seconded. Any discussion? We are voting on the amendment. Uh, uh, Rokovo, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? The amendment is passed 7 to 0. A council, very good, will now vote on the amended motion. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Thank you, council. Item 26. Second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property between South Norton Avenue and vacated South Duluth Avenue and West 39th Street and West 41st Street from the RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban District and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District to the C4 Commercial Regional District, including conditions as allowed in Section 16650C, placing limitations on regulations and adding additional transitional requirements within the RE5 form, petition number 2541-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval with the following stipulations, which have been added to the ordinance. Number one, an alternative site plan, including detailed buffer yard plans, be approved by the Planning Commission. 
Two, the proposed 113 employee parking spaces, 61 within the new parking lot and 52 behind the existing Billion Auto Kia building will be permanently marked and reserved for Billion employees only. And three, uses will be limited to outdoor motor vehicle sales and display and associated employee parking areas. Uh, Jason Beaver representing Planning and Building Services. Uh, this is an application by uh, Billion Company. Um, it is located between South Norton Avenue and the vacated South Duluth Avenue, and then West 39th Street and West 41st Street. It's roughly 3.1 acres. Uh, the purpose of this application is to demolish the existing homes uh, on the lots and construct a new uh, parking lot with roughly 420 parking spaces. Um, these will be for additional sales, display, and employee parking lots. Um, a level D buffer yard will be required along the north and west uh, property lines. Uh, this does include a 22 and a half foot setback, a six foot berm, and 50 units of landscaping per 100 lineal feet. Um, there will also be some limitations on parking along Norton and West 39th Street. Um, this uh, graphic here kind of indicates some of those. Uh, the Public Works is proposing to limit to two hour parking along Norton Avenue, Monday through Friday, um, eight to six on just the east side. Uh, then also on both sides of West 39th Street in the blue will also be uh, regulated to, uh, um, will also be regulated to two hour parking. Uh, the proposal is also to put a four way stop at the intersection of Norton and West 39th Street. Um, as uh, Lori indicated, this was uh, recommended for approval by the Planning Commission and added those three stipulations that she went through before. Jason, thank you. Council would, in, yes, Councilor Jameson. If I could, Jason, uh, help me understand the transition between C4 and single family homes. I get the idea that C4 has the additional buffering. You called it a level four, I think you called it. Level D. Level D, Level D. correct. Uh, could you just help explain uh, you know, how, do, how do you do that? And, and uh, what about, wouldn't it go normally C4, C3, C2, you know, duplexes? Why, how do we do this? How do we, how do you justify this, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, that's a good point. Normally it does kind of transition down from the highest intensity commercial use um, and that was an option for this parking lot to zone it to C2. Um, however, staff did feel uh, since this is a continuation of the existing billion uh, building and Lewis building which is roughly 100,000 square feet that this property should be zoned C4. Um, and that C4 uh, zoning district then does allow us to uh, to do that bigger um, level D buffer yard. If we would have separated this property out um, and done say C2 on it, technically shape places or the Shapes Who Falls uh, comprehensive plan would say that's a three compatibility where it's more compatible. But we also lose that additional setback. We go from 30 to, or from 45 to 30, uh, actually 22 and a half to 15 with the right of way. We go from a six foot berm, which would be required in the level D to a four foot berm. And we also go down from 50 units of landscaping to 40 units. Um, and just a rough idea of how many units that would be, uh, roughly 381 landscape units would be required if we zoned at C4. Um, and then it would go down to 305 landscape units if say we would, we would zone at C2. Um, and just an idea of what 76 more landscape units, that's roughly 10 deciduous shade trees or 15 ornamental trees or roughly 76 shrubs or perennials. So as a staff, we felt that this is a true C4 um, development and so they should provide the maximum buffer yard that we can have them provide. If I could, thank you. The, uh, well, the, uh, the neighbors have gotta be just freaking out with a C4 getting uh, sit right across the street for them. And I get the berm idea and I get those uh, rules from shaped places, but um, I'm just concerned. And maybe we could talk, we'll, we'll talk about it later just in off the radar, but I'm just concerned about, concerned about that transition. We just say it's C4, there's a single family next door. We would never want that. Here we're proposing it because of its existing use and on the corner I get some of that, but. It just seems so limited. Let me ask you this, then I'll leave you alone. Could we have C2 but require C4 buffering? 
That would be an option to to require or to have C2 on that lot. Um, and then we already have a condition that this specific uh, buffer yard go back to the Planning Commission with for an alternative site plan to do the buffer yard that they're requiring. Um, I guess staff just feels that it's all one parcel, it's all one development that we should zone it all C4 is kind of where we're coming from on that. Thank you. Very good. Yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Uh, <clears throat> you were stating that uh, on the east side of Norton, there would be parking regulations there for two hours? Yep, on the east side just north of the proposed exit or the uh, access point onto Norton, you can see it in the green area. Um, and they would limit two hour parking on that east side is what engineering was proposing. Uh, on the west side, obviously, there's a lot of houses, so it'd be difficult to, to eliminate or uh, to have two hour parking on that west side. Okay, and then my question is gonna be, can we just uh, have no parking there at all? Uh, that's something we can definitely go to the applicant and for second read and see if they would be willing to do that. And I can definitely talk to engineering if that's something that I, they I guess because as we look at this in this design and uh, that they're going to finally have employee parking, I really don't see the, a need for parking along that edge. Oh. And that will, I, I, just, I just don't. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Erickson. Well, maybe in response to that, maybe it's not necessarily for the employees, but it's for those houses there that have guests and not a lot of driveway to be able to park there during the day. Maybe they're working nights or days or whatever, and to have that capability to park there I think is important. My question is if we can set a condition that um, doesn't allow them to build on this. Yep, that's one of the conditions, number three, that the use is limited to this rezoning or for auto display uh, sales, excuse me, sales display and employee parking. So they would not be allowed to construct I a building on this. I would include not constructing nope, a building. that was okay. part of the ordinance. Thanks, I just wanted clarification. Yes, Councilor Jameson. I wanted to follow up, I like Councilor Anderson's thought process of eliminating the park at for parking for uh, some other issues, but it would take, I think, those property owners to the west to agree to uh, have their parking removed on the street. It wouldn't just be, uh, city staff could recommend it, I suppose, but it's not up to billions. But if those neighbors wanted to do it and thought that that was good for them, I'm supportive of that. Mayor, if I may. Yes, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind, Councilor Buck. I'm sorry. I, I just would um, kind of enlighten you on the parking issue. I asked um, traffic folks if we would take that parking out, what would be the what would, would that help? And the reaction from residents was that no, we need parking there. And the reaction from traffic was taking that parking out completely speeds up the traffic on that street and it, the neighbors are really not excited about that. The neighbors have, we have tried really hard with this project to meet all the concerns that the neighbors have except that they don't want it there. <laughs> but we've really tried to come to a compromise here and I, I, I think that you're questioning things that we've really, it, they're great questions, but we've really gone in depth on this project down to billion has been just awesome. Mm -hmm. And they, they need to hear that, that billion has agreed to all of these conditions. And I think that, yeah, it's a tough sell, but that parking lot, that you know, auto sales has been there for years. It's just moving over a little bit. It's still, it's bumping up to housing just like it has all along, so. Councilor Anderson, Jr. And I was just going to say, I just do, do remember when we had public testimony that uh, a few of the neighbors did come up and st state that because of the narrowness of Norton, when there's parking on both sides, there's only room for one vehicle to slide through there. So that's why I was thinking there, the west side does keep its parking. And so the, the neighbors would have the parking in front of their homes, just not on that east side but I'm, I'm open to you know, yeah. whatever we feel is might. right for the neighbors. Mr. Mayor, they, they're, many of them are only single car garages with very small driveway as well. And, and as we know, we're all working two families. Very many of us have at least two cars. And so it, it is an issue just for the residents there. So I would encourage you to adopt this when we have that opportunity. Council, would anybody want to set a data hearing second reading for Tuesday, October 6th for this item? Data hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 6th at second 7 Anderson. p.m. Councilors, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Dennis passed 7 to 0. Item 27. 
First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 4605 South Louise Avenue from the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District to the O Office District, petition number 3236-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Bob Winkles. Uh, it's roughly 28, or excuse me, 0.2 acres in size. It is located just uh, north of 57th and Louise intersection. Uh, the purpose of this, uh, that house that's actually shown in the aerial, this is an old aerial, that house has been demolished. Uh, the applicant is looking at combining this lot with the existing office lot to the north and the south and then construct a future office development. Move to approve, Erickson. Second. Second. Thank you. Uh, we are setting a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, October 6th. Uh, Councilor Erickson made that motion. Councilor Karski seconded it. A roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Ralphing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 28. 28 is first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property southwest of Great Bear Recreation Area from the AG Agriculture District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, petition number 3271 2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, the applicant and owner here are Stone Arch Partners. Uh, it is located just south, kind of west of Great Bear Recreation Area. It's roughly 40 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this specific rezoning is to rezone it to single family and construct roughly eight lots with each lot containing one single family uh, residential use. Jason, thank you. Question. Yes, Councilor Erickson. Do you, do you have an area that shows the roads that go in and out of this development? Uh, this is all part of that uh, Canterbury Heights that we've had uh, significant discussions on and I and uh, at the second reading, I believe the development to the east, uh, the Canterbury Heights one, uh, will also be on the agenda. So hopefully then we will have an update on how all these fit together. Uh, we are continuing to work out an access plan with the different developers up there that will meet uh, the neighbors, hopefully, concerns to try and figure out a way to get all these guys working together to get some other additional accesses into these developments. Has there been um, neighborhood meetings with the Canterbury folks in relation to this as they'll, as it looks, will be coming out of their neighborhood, et cetera, in that area? There has been significant uh, neighborhood involvement, meetings with them from the Canterbury people, uh, Mr. Schutte, who's on the property to the east, and I believe with these two, meeting with the neighbors and the specific landowners, I think Van Busker Companies is also an owner up there, on trying to figure out a way for everybody to kind of get what they want, to get, get accesses, get development going, and, and it's all kind of working together. It's one piece. All right. Thank so hopefully you. we'll have a, a better update at the second reading. So Thank you. Councilor Anderson, uh, Jr. I will just tell the council that I've already had calls from the neighborhood. They will be here, and uh, we definitely need to figure out that ex exit and access points up there. And they do know the re resolution to that. Yep. Councils, thank you. Would anybody want to set a date of hearing, second reading for Tuesday, October 6th? So move, Anderson. Second, Rolfing. Council Anderson Jr. has made that motion. Second by Council Rolfing. A roll call vote, please. Council Members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 29. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at 4800 South Louise Avenue from the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District to the C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar District, petition number 3285-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval. Uh, the applicant here is Raquel Blount with Lloyd Companies. Uh, the owner is Gerald Zutz. Um, it, it is located at the southeast corner of 55th Street and Louise Avenue. Um, the the r size is roughly 0.33 acres, and the, perf the purpose of this specific rezoning is to combine this commercial lot with the two to the south that were just rezoned commercial within the last year. And then they're looking at constructing a strip center similar to one on the northeast corner of 57th and Louise that's already there. Council, what do you want to set a data hearing, second reading for Tuesday, October 6th for this item? So moved, Erickson. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Erickson's made that motion, seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call vote, please. 
Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed seven to zero. Item 30. First reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property at the southwest corner of West 12th Street and South Discovery Avenue from the CN Conservation District to the RA1 Apartment Residential Low Density District, including conditions as allowed in Section 16650C, placing limitations on regulations within the MD1 form, petition number 3238-2015, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval four to two with the following stipulation which has been added to the ordinance. Buildings must be no more than one story in height. Uh, the applicant here is Nick Van Overscheld. Uh, the owner is Steve Melgard. Uh, it is roughly 3.06 acres in size. It's currently a vacant parcel uh, with a portion of it in the northeast corner that's going to remain outside the rezoning area is actually in the flood way. And then a northern portion of this lot is also located within the special flood hazard area. Uh, the purpose of this is to construct uh, five one-story buildings ranging in size from three units to a maximum size of the building on the southwest corner to nine units. Uh, we did have significant neighborhood opposition uh, to this specific rezoning request. Uh, a number of neighbors attended the Planning Commission meeting and uh, I'm assuming will be here at the City Council for second reading. Uh, most of their concerns were the usual ones that we hear, the traffic, property values, and drainage. Um, they were concerned with the size. Uh, they, did, they were concerned that they could be two stories. Um, the applicant did indicate that this is what he's looking at, constructing a single story um, units, a maximum of nine together. They will be rentals. Uh, the Planning Commission did then uh, actually recommend approval with the condition to actually limit or put a condition on this rezoning to limit the size to one story in height so he, so he would only be able to build similar to what he's showing here. Yes, Councilor Erickson. Um, first of all, my, my first question, has there been any additional neighborhood meetings? Because the first meeting was not a neighborhood meeting. It was the neighborhood upset and he showed up. That I haven't, uh, I haven't heard from the applicant or the owner and Yes, that first one that we did suggest that he have a neighborhood meeting wasn't, as you indicated, wasn't his suggestion of a neighborhood meeting. It was him showing up because he, the owner of this property is a resident of Rocky Ridge. He was the original developer of all that out there. Um, and I don't think it went very well as you guys probably saw in the news. Mm -hmm. um, so I can definitely reach out to him again. I would hope they would go back out there. Um, I don't know how much good it will do. I think this uh, neighborhood is opposed to this request no matter what they construct there. A couple of other questions I have if I may, Mr. Mayor. Uh, is this income based? That I don't know. I don't believe he's going for income based. He has been constructing similar units on 69th and T. Ellis. I think he's just constructing normal, you know, eight, nine unit townhome style things. Okay, yep. my other question, um, I have two, I'm no, sorry. sorry, maybe somebody else is thinking this. Um, my first question, can you go back a slide, please? Thank you. That one, thank you. Can that driveway, I know these are just plans and we're not approving yep. the plan, we're approving the rezone, I, I get it. However, this plan is what people, mm -hmm. I, this, this is their Bible here, this is what they think is gonna happen. So can we move that road um, further um, to the east, so it's not as close to those single family, ha single family homes because that road right there literally will butt up right. Are, are you indicating the one that's running between the nine unit and uh, nine six? and six? Yes, yes. between the nine uh, and six. That? If we could move that east somehow or redevelop, I, I, I don't know. That's just a thought that I have to, sure. to kick it down a little bit, a little bit further. So because across the street where it says BMP, that's empty. Yeah, and the, and the lot actually to the south is also empty right. currently. So there would um, be an access off of Discovery. And if you could move that access off of Browning. I will take that suggestion to him. I have a feeling we may get some pushback from traffic engineering right, well. <laughs> on that because of 12th and Discovery is a projected lighted intersection. Right. Um, so they like to have access standards from there. They have to be so far back. But I will, uh, I will talk to traffic engineering if that's a possibility. But I have a feeling that they're going to want the access that they're showing on Discovery actually 
on this on the east west street well i'm good with the discovery i'm talking about the browning one yeah but i don't think they're going to i don't think they're going to allow an access on discovery i think that access is going to get shifted oh, to there the won't same. even be one <laughs> yeah okay uh, my so, last question is this is this was conservation what happens what 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 safeguard do we have to people i always tell people you buy by empty land there's a risk. I understand that. However, what safeguard is there um, for maybe if it's not this neighborhood, another neighborhood, that if it's actually conservation and and deemed to take the extra water coming through the neighborhood? I mean, we had cre I, I I live not in a west side, not too far from here, um, but it's not in my backyard. Um, but what what? What's going to happen with that conservation? What, the drainage? The, I mean, that little sliver certainly isn't a whole lot. And this this lot was was zoned um, recreation under the old ordinance and then transferred to conservation. I don't. This lot was never designed for detention or anything. I believe that was what the lot to the east that you can see is vacant and is also zoned con conservation. I think the owner, when he annexed the, all this property in and zoned all this property in to the end of 2001, beginning of 2002, always planned on developing it. Um, the standard drainage thing is they can't discharge any more water than what's already coming off the site. Otherwise, they have to construct BMPs to hold it back and then discharge it at that same rate. Okay. Um, you know, we look at it as West 12th, a discovery, a major arterial, a collector as a we got storage garages to the west as a as a transition, a good transition to single family homes is kind of how we're looking at it. But okay. um, it was on conservation before, and I kind of understand that too. So. Great. Okay. Thanks for answering. Hey, Councilor Kelly. Uh, Jason, I think one of the last things you stated uh, there are going to be rentals, not owner occupied. I believe yes, they will be rentals. If they were going to be owner occupied, we probably would have done a little less of a zoning district. They would have actually platted all these separate units off, and we could have went to more of a townhome district. Um, but he has indicated that they will be rentals. Thank you, Councilor Anderson Jr. No. Okay, very Sorry. good, Council. Yes, Councilor Jamison. Thank you, uh, Jason. The. Uh, <clears throat> Property, I know you said the property to the south, there's a home, single family home that's vacant. Who owns that? Is it owned by the developer who is building the, or selling I the would, site? I would assume that that's, I, I don't know for sure, but I would assume that's owned by Mr. Melgard too, since he was the original developer of that whole area. He annexed it and he zoned it, all the acres, um, and then Rocky Ridge to the east. Um, I'm assuming he's still the owner, but I can definitely check on that. And I just, future. could you point, are you assuming, I'm assuming it's that spot that's kind of got a little the, 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 the kind of brown little line that's running on there, is that where you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm assuming that's owned by Mr. Melgard also, but I can definitely check for you um, who the current owner is. And the other is that uh, right to the west of that little corner, there is the uh, footings for a home to be built uh, that's going to be right next door to it. So my question is on the on the approval of the zoning, if we wanted to put a condition about buffering between that house and others, and or um, say the uh, use of brick or some other siding or not something, can we add those stipulations? My interpretation of the specific interpretations you can put on, um, and actually I have them right here, um, you can put limitations in certain uses typical, typically eligible within a zoning district. Uh, similar to the billion, billion one that we just handled. Normally you can build a building, we put a condition that they couldn't build a building. Normally in the RE5 form you can build a building. Or additional transitional requirements for the zoning district to transition to adjacent zoning districts by conditioning the approval of an alternative site plan. So if you wanted more extensive buffering than what's required by the ordinance. They are required, I believe, to, to do a, what's called a level B buffer yard, which is a 15 foot setback. And then they would have either, a, I believe it's a two foot berm and a, or a four foot fence and then 30 units of landscaping. You could condition them to go to planning commission on an alternative site plan to do something better than that if you wanted to. Thank you, thank you. Councilors, uh, thank you. Would anybody want to set a date of hearing? Second reading for Tuesday, October 6th. So move. Second. Thank you, Councilors. Uh, Councilor Anderson Jr. and Councilor Erpenbach got that in. And a roll call vote, please. Council members Erickson? 
Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 32. A resolution approving the special assessment role for the Main Street Business Improvement District in the City of Sioux Falls. Good evening, Mayor, Council, uh, Dustin Powers with the Community Development Office. Uh, item 32 is asking for council approval for a special assessment levy for the Main Street um, Business Improvement District uh, for downtown. Uh, the map on the projection screen uh, in the yellow outline shows the, the boundaries of the Main Street bid. Uh, within those boundaries, there's approximately 450 acres, and this resolution tonight will affect 243 of the properties within that boundary. Uh, revenue generated by uh, the Business Improvement District helps fund programming, uh, services, and activities in downtown. Uh, these funds are administrated by uh, Downtown Sioux Falls Incorporated, and Joe Batchelor uh, is here tonight uh, to speak on their behalf. Um, but before uh, I have uh, Joe come up, I wanted to point out a couple quick items uh, related to tonight's resolution. Uh, the resolution that uh, you're voting on tonight has a cumulative assessment of $156,126.32 that is spread through, um, over those 243 properties. Uh, the maximum assessment on any individual property is $1,700. Uh, the bid has been in place since 1989, so this is the 26th year that uh, we are asking for council approval uh, for uh, this Main Street bid. And this item was brought in front of the Main Street uh, Business Improvement District Board on August 26th, um, and they are an advisory board that reviews the bid every year and the budget for the bid and then recommends, makes a recommendation to council every year. On August 26th, they unanimously recommended approval for this year's uh, bid assessment. So with that, I'll have uh, Joe come up and uh, speak on downtown Sioux Falls' his behalf. Dustin, thank you, Joe, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, councilors, good evening. Uh, I don't have a formal presentation per se. Uh, I just wanted to go over some of the things that downtown Sioux Falls does for the district. Uh, the impact that we have, uh, I think, is um, uh, profound. I think that we, we do have a positive impact on the neighborhood. We have our cleaning green team that uh, cleans the sidewalks and picks up the trash. We uh, have implemented <coughs> safety initiatives. We work on economic development initiatives. Um, we have uh, also do marketing, promotion, um, and communications for uh, the downtown businesses uh, and put on a number of events such as the River Fest, which was um, one of our last uh, signature events this summer, which was a uh, roaring success. Um, the bid money also goes to help fund uh, personnel and operations um, as um, uh, allowed by the uh, state statute. Um, so the budget for this year is 1,000, I'm sorry, uh, $162,049. Uh, that is in excess of the mon uh, monies that the uh, bid roll brings in, which is also a requirement of the state statute, so that um, there is not money left over at the end of the year that is carried over to the next budget. We are using all of that money year to year. So um, with that, um, I'll leave it there, and I can go into any details that you would like if you have any questions. Joe, thank you. Before I go to the council, folks, is there anybody else in the audience who wants to speak to this item? Joe, thank you. Councilors, thank uh, you. Councilor, uh, Councilor Karski. Thank you. Joe, has the $1,700 maximum assessment ever been changed? Uh, as far as I understand, it has not. Okay. And somebody pointed this out to me just recently that the higher valued properties have never seen an increase, but the lower valued ones continually creep up, so they've lost that disparity where the smaller ones probably are paying a disproportionate share of the budget. And any comment on that or thoughts? Has that been looked at? Is that a number that can be reviewed? I'll let Dustin Powers address that. 
yes, uh, that has been a conversation that's come up uh, with our, our bid board as we review that every year. We will be looking at uh, the city ordinance that looks at what that cap is per year. Um, so that'll be something that we will be looking at addressing with the bid board going forward. And, and that'll be something that will bring the community involved, involvement in to you know, get business input as well, since they are the ones paying towards uh, the business improvement district. Thank you. Dustin, per Councilor Karski's question though, is it disparate? Uh, he, had, he had asked specifically, is there a disparate uh, amount that a smaller, I don't know, know exactly the exact term that Councilor Karski used, but a, a smaller business versus a larger business, is it disparate? Yeah, basically the, the way the assessment is run, it's based on your property valuation. So what you pay is based on your property valuation and there are for, there's a formula that figures that out. But um, properties that are, let's say $10 million, they're capped at 1,700 and there's a property at a million dollars that each property value keeps raising, um, but only the, the lower valued property increases in the bid payment and the other one that's already at the cap. So that gap does close. So the people with, uh, or the businesses and property owners with lower valued properties, you know, are paying probably a greater percentage based on their valuation than those larger valued properties. Okay. Mayor? Yes, uh, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Um, Joel, if you could just come up, uh, when you first came up, you didn't introduce yourself. I'd like you to introduce yourself to the city of Sioux Falls. Sure. So, Just Joe Bachelor, and born and raised here in Sioux Falls, and uh, I've uh, been away for a number of years, but I'm happy to be back and running downtown Sioux Falls Incorporated. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Welcome back, Joe. Thank you. Council, I, I'm embarrassed to ask, do we have a, a, mo a don't think so. move for approval? Thank you, Councilor. Second, Second Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor. Was that Councilor Kursky? Thank you, Councilor Kursky. Uh, a... Roll call, please. Council members Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rothing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0, item 33. A resolution amending resolution number 12814 that established a pay for performance program for the city council appointed positions. Uh, yes, Councilor Karski? Thank you, Mayor. Um, as we did in budget amendment number 5, we expanded our budget by $42,000 to for overlap and training of a Sioux Falls City clerk. Um, along with the training and overlap, we had um, human resources do a study to determine um, fair compensation or how competitive we are in our compensation of our city clerk for like positions um, as much as possible within um, private um, enterprise and uh, other governments and it was discovered that we um, needed to do some pay increase to fairly compensate that per person and to attract um, new applicants to the position of city clerk. Councilor uh, Karski, thanks for the explanation. Move for approval, Anderson. Second, Erpenbach. Then a motion to approve, seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. Councilor Kiley. I would just like to say that we have been getting services from Lori at a very bargain mm -hmm. price here, and I <laughs> greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Lori. You're welcome. Very good. I'm not supposed to say anything, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, roll call, please. Council members Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Jameson? Yes. Karski? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Anderson? Yes. That has passed 7 to 0. Thank you, Council. Any other discussion? Yes, Councilor Anderson, Jr. Just one thing. I want to reach out to our missing counselor, uh, Kermit Staggers, and uh, say, Kermit, you are missed, and get well soon and get back here. Councilor Anderson, Jr., thank you. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been a motion to adjourn this meeting. Uh, thank you so much, Council, for your work, your effort, your time, your talents. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? This meeting is adjourned to Falls. Make it a great, great night.